Yo, what's up? My name is Petrowski, and welcome to my complete guide on how to get into PvP in Pokey MMO. Now, PvP can be a really daunting task for new players, and I understand why. The average Pokemon PvP player is quite better than your average Pokemon Showdown player, in my personal opinion and from my personal experience. It's a much more niche audience, and usually that niche audience has put a lot more time into theory crafting and building the perfect team, since there's actually a cost to building that team, as opposed to in Showdown, you can just input the numbers and input the data. And since there is that pretty big barrier to entry for new players when getting into the game, when getting into PvP, when trying to build a team, it's really important to have a pretty in-depth guide covering everything, so I'm going to do my best today. First things first, let's go ahead and cover the basics. This little PvP ball slash icon down here in the bottom right hand corner of my screen is going to be your lifeline. This is going to be how you queue into PvP, how you check what's going on in the PvP news and metagame, and so much more. Let's go ahead and click it and see what it has to offer us. Let's go to matchmaking sign up. We'll cover the other things in a quick second. So first things first, under the sign up, we can queue up into OU, UU, NU, doubles, and randoms. Now, if you don't know, these are the different tiers of Pokemon PvP. This is not a Pokemon specific thing, but in any Pokemon PvP scene, Pokemon will always be split up into tiers. You can also see the tiers really nicely laid out over on the Pokedex. So if you're wondering which Pokemon are in what tier, you can go to Ubers, which which is all the legendaries that aren't able to be obtained. It's not really a tier in Pokemon, so don't worry about that. There's Overused, which these are the most powerful Pokemon in the game for PvP. Overused, or OU, uh, means they're very often used. And PvP tiers are usually based on st uh, usage statistic, and we'll cover that more in a second. But essentially, how often a Pokemon is used means it's more likely the better that it is, therefore it gets bumped up to higher tiers. So OU is the most used and most powerful Pokemon. UU are underused kind of in the middle and you or never used is kind of the weakest tier and then untiered is kind of everything that falls below and you these are Pokemon that are considered too weak quote unquote to be an NU officially but a lot of these Pokemon do see play and NU in other tiers. It's also important to note that you can use Pokemon from lower tiers in higher tiers, but you cannot use Pokemon from higher tiers in lower tiers, if that makes sense. I'll explain it such as, if you're playing OU, if you're queuing up for OU, you can use any Pokemon in the OU tier, UU, NU, or untiered. However, if you're queuing up for UU, you cannot use OU Pokemon, but you can use any Pokemon from UU, NU, you and untiered. Using Pokemon from lower tiers to sometimes create the perfect synergy and perfect team composition is sometimes more important than using just the most powerful Pokemon. However, if you are a new player, I recommend sticking to the most powerful Pokemon because there's a reason why they're the most powerful and usually it's going to be a lot easier way to learn. All right, but now that we've covered tiers, let's go ahead and jump back over to the PvP icon and go over to matchmaking sign up. Now back over on Matchback and Sign Up, there are two tiers that we haven't discussed yet because they aren't organized in the Pokedex. Randoms essentially gives you a random set of six Pokemon, but it's not fully random. They are like created, generated sets that are meant to be balanced, and higher level Pokemon uh, will be weaker Pokemon. So for example, Delibird comes out like level 94 or something, while whereas Garchomp, a very, very strong Pokemon, comes out level like 69 or something. So there is a lot of there's a lot of balancing in randoms. It's not just full RNG, and it's a huge, huge hugely important asset to new players randoms is the best way to really break into pvp but we're not quite there yet let's talk about doubles for a quick sec now doubles in pokemon is not like the doubles outside of pokemon vgc which is essentially the official pokemon format it's a very exciting format doubles is an extremely complex extremely advanced format uh, if you want to play the most advanced strategic kind of difficult pokemon possible doubles is really your way to go whenever you're controlling two pokemon versus two pokemon you have four slots in the field it just infinitely complicates things versus a 1v1 now unfortunately pokemon doubles is a little lower in terms of popularity even though it's a pretty interesting format and it is 6v6 which means you just bring six pokemon versus six pokemon whereas in vgc or po the official pokemon format it's actually uh 6v6 but you pick four uh and leave two so you actually pick four pokemon bring those to the battle and sort of strategize against your opponent's team for this it's just you bring all six pokemon all right, and then we move on to personal stats, and this is going to show your rank, your win-loss, your percentage, you know, win rate percentage, whatever, uh, the matchmaking rewards, which are the PvP rewards in Pokemon, etc., etc. 
Now the best reward when playing PvP is usually the free competitive Pokemon. This is a fantastic way for new players to continue to snowball and get more and more into PvP and actually develop more and more Pokemon and more and more team comps is by winning these free competitive Pokemon. This should be your main goal when playing PvP in my personal opinion if you're trying to get into it. Now these rewards also reset every 14 days so these rotate pretty rapidly and you do have to play quite a few games within those 14 days to win that reward definitely keep that in mind. If you want to win this Pokemon and you go to this page and it says rewards expires in like two days there's a really good chance that unfortunately you might not have enough time to play the 60 games or so required to win this Pokemon so definitely be careful about that what you aim for with your goals you might just want to wait two days for the next one to pop up but it's always good to practice of course. Now, seasons are kind of strange in Pokemon. So you have those rewards that reset every two weeks, but then you also have PvP seasons, which rotate out every three months, I believe. And then you also have PvP changes that happen every one month, every, uh, tier changes. So there's a couple things to keep in mind. Once again, rewards rotate every two weeks. Um, the seasons change every three months. So if starting from January, so it should be from January uh, until the end of March, that's season season one and then like from you know april to you know whatever uh three month segments and then you have uh tier changes which happen every month i believe on the first of the month now tier changes happen because pokemon are constantly evolving things are constantly changing moves are being added to the game abilities are being added and when a pokemon is either too good or too bad in a tier it gets moved down and that's when we go over to the statistics page this is your bread and butter if you are trying to learn about pvp whether to get into it whether you're a veteran doesn't matter how good you are at pvp you should be checking this page every single day probably multiple times a day if you are trying to improve at pvp this is one of the most insane resources that Pokemon offers. It is truly insane that we have this information. So the statistic page covers all of the top Pokemon in every tier, all of the Pokemon in general. We see their usage percentage, we see their win rates, and then if we click that Pokemon, such as Garchomp, we can see the top abilities being used, we can see the top items being used, broken down by percentage, we can see the top natures being used, and we can even see the most common allies being used with those Pokemon and kind of draw some conclusions based on that information. Unfortunately, not everything is given to us. We don't have access to the move pool, for example. I would love to see something like that. Um, but usually you can sort of piece together the information. So for example, uh, we can see that uh, Garchomp, for example, is running Life Orb 27% of the time at the moment. There have been times where Choice Scarf has been in the metagame and it's been much, usually Choice Scarf is much higher percentage rate, but sometimes if the metagame slows down, Life Orb pops up, etc., etc. So understanding, hey, I'm going up against my opponent, they have a Garchomp, there's a chance that his Garchomp has a Life Orb, there's a chance that his Garchomp has a Focus Sash, a Choice Scarf, Leftovers, etc. Now, first things first, you would assume, okay, he probably has a Life Orb because it's the most used item, but then you want to look at his team and think, you know what, does he have a Pokemon faster than this Garchomp? Does he need Scarf to make this Garchomp his sort of speedy Pokemon? Um, does he have a tank? Is this actually a tank Garchomp? Because he has no Blissey, I don't see, you know, a Blissey, a Hippowdon, on whatever you don't see anything to actually help him tank stuff so you're not, oh you know what this might actually be tank guard chop it might be leftovers or rocky helmet it's really important to use that information but we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves let's slow down it can get really complex but do keep in mind that pvp statistics are probably the most powerful thing within the game and you can check them up here uh ou uu nu this is also a really important resource for making pokeyen i always recommend people that if you want to breed for profit usually just breeding the most used pokemon in pvp right now is always a great way to do so uh here's the random statistics the random statistics are a little more funny because you can't really like there's no usage statistics you can't really pick them um but there is a win rate percentage which is actually important to understand and so certain Pokemon are more powerful in randoms and it should be important to value those Pokemon a little higher uh, in your matches. Now there is a quick little glitch or bug that if you go to randoms and then switch back to NU, uh, it'll actually be sorting by win rate percentage as opposed to usage. All you need to do to fix that is just go ahead and left click on usage. 
All right, but before we dive too deep into PvP statistics, let's cover the basics such as clauses, bans, and help. These are going to be some of the most interesting things, just basic things to cover. So for clauses, clauses are essentially things in PvP that uh, change the rules slightly from traditional Pokemon, very, very slightly um, from like base game stuff. So we have the evasion clause in Pokemon, moves which raise evasion, which will, will have no effect, bright powder and lax and sense cannot be used. So this bans things uh, like minimize and things like double team from pvp because it's just cheesy rng strategy it does not ban things like sand attack you can actually lower the uh evasion um or the accuracy of the opposing pokemon but you cannot raise the evasion of your pokemon the reason being if you sand attack an opponent's pokemon into oblivion they can always just switch out uh, unless you're mean looking them or trapping them in some way but usually at that point um, they've made a mistake or there's some way to let that Pokemon die, or bring a new Pokemon into the revenge kill or something. But with evasion, um, it's only it only moves that raise your actual evasion. And then Bright Powder and Lax and Sense are items that raise your evasion. Those are banned. The Sleep Clause, you may only sleep one of your opponent's Pokemon at a time. Now, I believe in Pokemon, if you rest on a Pokemon and then switch a different Pokemon in, your opponent can still sleep that Pokemon. So you can still have two Pokemon asleep, I believe. Someone could correct me. Um... Um, but if you like rest it yourself, but you can't spore all six of your opponent's Pokemon. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, the Oko Clause, one hit KO, knockout moves will have no effect. Things like Sheer Cold, Fissure, just RNG, really lame stuff. Uh, it's funny that VG Seed slash doubles and traditional Pokemon is currently having a huge issue with that, which is really funny. Um, and then the Unique Species Clause, you cannot enter with identical species in your party. So this prevents things like running double Typhlosion with Eruption or just really dumb strategies or just very um, not fun, very non-identical teams. Then moving on to bans. So this is important. These are things that are actually banned. The yellow means that it's being kind of speculated on though, and it's being discussed. It's not quite banned yet. The red means that it's banned. So in all tiers, the moody ability is banned. Uh, very, very powerful, very annoying ability. It's been banned in traditional Pokemon play many many times um it's just a super rng fest and it's something that can also raise evasion uh underused salamance has been being evaluated and underused for quite a bit now uh, he's very very powerful he's performing really well and we can once again check that by using the pvp statistics page currently the most played pokemon in the tier and at a 54.6 percent win rate that is extremely high for being the most played pokemon that's very very impressive so once again a good reason to evaluate it Cloyster recently got moved down to NU, and it's also being evaluated. I don't think it's doing as well as Quagsire, but it definitely can be a uh, pressuring Pokemon. So it's not doing as, as well, nearly little. So it's doing pretty poorly, honestly, kind of surprisingly. Uh, but it's still being evaluated. It's a very tricky Pokemon to get right. Uh, we don't want it to be too oppressive or just sort of counter too many things without one Pokemon being uh, in the game to actually answer it. But these might be entirely different by the time you watch this video, and it's why it's really important to always check this stuff out. All right, here's the help page, and this page actually just explains a lot of things that I've already talked about. We'll go ahead and run through them honestly. So for casual, I don't recommend ever queuing for casual play. There's pretty much no reason to ever queue for casual play, uh, aside from like being scared about not losing ELO. But man, if you're new to the game, I promise you... Don't worry about not losing ELO. You're going to lose 100 games anyway. It's it, You're just going to lose. It sucks. Um, but to get to this game, you have to be able to lose a ton and just be okay with it. It's really, really tough. I lose a ton still. When I come back into people, if I take a break and come back you always lose a ton it's just it's the way of the game if you're not practicing you're not getting better um it's just it's bound to happen right you don't deserve to win if you don't have the practice and haven't put in the time like other people so it only makes sense um it's okay to lose you'd rather just play it's better to play ranked because first of all you gain rewards still even if you're losing a ton and then secondly you gain way better practice you're going to be practicing against better players you're going to be playing better you're going to be performing optimally versus casual. You're going to be playing against worse players. You're not going to improve as much and you're not earning any rewards. Moving on to ranked BP in matchmaking rewards is what you get. Wins are worth up to 100 matchmaking reward points. The more of a win streak you're on, the more matchmaking reward points you get. I believe you get like 30 on a basic win. So keep that in mind. I believe I could be wrong. Uh, win slash losses tracking leaderboards, of course. Inactive players, ELO will decay over time. This is important. I can actually show you guys an example of this. So one of my better seasons, uh, personal stats, randoms. I believe it was season nine. Season nine is fine, but... Or some better ones, season 10, season 8, I'm not sure. Um, but 
yeah the point is we'll go to season nine uh the point is you can see my final rating here is 600 now with this win loss rate my my rating i believe was like 650 or something 660 it was higher than this but what happens is if you don't play if you have a really good win rate or whatever and you don't play you'll actually decay down to 600 so 600 is the baseline of which you'll to of which you'll decay to this is a very very common system in ranked play uh to avoid people just sort of uh rank sitting in like top leaderboard spots sitting and being inactive and not playing exclusive rewards available for top players you can earn pvp rewards and honestly one of the best rewards that isn't talked about too much in pokemon Mo pvp is actually from tournaments tournaments can win you some pretty insane prizes i'm talking like shiny pokemon i'm talking perfect six times 31 competitive pokemon i'm talking tens of millions of pokey yen but you do have to be some of the best to actually consistently compete in them and even get a chance at winning but it's a worthwhile long-term goal to keep in mind for sure now we move on to top players are invited to season and tournaments this is really cool as well rewards accumulated for winning and matchmaking normal reward brackets expire every two weeks i mentioned that seasonal rewards update every pvp season more rewards are available for different tiers that is really tr true so that's a great thing to mention if you want to play different tiers of pokemon i really recommend everyone who wants to get into pvp playing randoms and then also playing one other tier at some point you want to start with randoms but doing randoms and nu or randoms and uu or randoms in ou for example or doubles obviously um i really recommend we're going to get to the, the steps and the pathing but randoms first and then ou second however we'll get into picking tiers a little more you can kind of do whatever tier you want um but it does get a little more complicated and i do recommend ou if you like ou i do recommend playing ou um you're gonna have the best chance at success in ou ou has the most amount of players so if you're a new player the 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 players at 500 elo in ou are going to be your best shot at victories uh versus the players at 500 elo in nu or 500 elo in uu these are usually much more talented much more experienced players they've built a specific team for it most people play ou which means the most average players are going to be playing ou back to the help page really quickly though pvp tier changes occur every month yep the tier changes large changes occur every pvp season the pokedex lists the current pokemon in a tier we covered that and then check the statistics tab for more the most popular one and like other stats and information on them now i'm gonna go ahead and just mention this here that if you want to use black white smoking for more information on the pokemon you can however please take it with a massive massive grain of salt the pokemon mo meta game couldn't be any more different from the black white smoke and metagame these are entirely different games with entirely different balancing pokemon generally has gen 9 mechanics and updates now we have the teleport buff um things like outrage are damage power different not as the same uh high dragon can't learn draco meteor garchomp can't learn swords dance we don't have legendaries we don't have terrakion we don't have landorus t we don't have heat train like there are so many millions of factors to why these metagames are so drastically different uh we don't have all hidden abilities in the game there's so many reasons i could go on and go on go on go on but uh let's go ahead and talk about the benefits of black white smogan you do, do get a really nice layout of all the pokemon's base stats you get a nice layout of the pokemon's typing and the pokemon's abilities uh this is really good information all the tiers will not be the same on black white smogan and pokemon for sure um keep in mind that when you go down to things like the overview once again you'll see things like heatran mentioned you'll see things like thunderous jirachi uh curum latios keldeo there's a lot of reasoning of including certain moves or certain things on Garchomp that won't even work for Pokemon because it's such a different game. So please keep this in mind. Huge, huge, huge grain of salt. But if you want a basic understanding of, hey, what type of moves should I be looking for on a Garchomp? What nature is good? What ability? What item? What EVs? Um, all of this is mostly correct. Like if you if you want to run a Choice Star for Garchomp, you probably do go Rough Skin. You do go Jolly Nature. You probably do go 2v2 Attack and 2v2 Speed EVs. All of this is actually pretty correct. Um, Outrage is incorrect because that move is not 120 base power in Pokemon. It's 90. Uh, Earthquake, Stone Edge, uh, Dragon Claw. A lot of these things are mostly correct. So if you want to run these, uh, you absolutely can and it's important to definitely like check this out uh, keep so we have stealth rockley we have different sets like black white smoking can be a good tool for pokemon but you have to take it with the utmost grain of salt we see a sword stance set here uh garchomp can't learn sword stance in pokemon so once again uh it can be a useful tool for learning the basics but you've got to cross reference a ton 
All right, but back on over to the game. We're almost done covering the basics. Can you believe it? This is just the first part of this video. This is going to be a very, very long video. And if this is, has been helpful so far and you are enjoying it, please do make sure to leave a like on the video and subscribing for daily Pokemon videos. You can follow my Twitch as well for streams Monday through Thursday at 12 p.m. ET. Um, I really do appreciate it. Any support does help out a ton. Obviously, only if you're enjoying the content. If you're sick of my content, sick of my voice, feel free to dislike. Anyways, continuing on, the leaderboards. So you can actually go to the leaderboards and see who is doing really well right now who is at the top rank one you know you can see OU, you this is a lot of games played which is awesome it's nuts you you and you doubles randoms this is important because it's important to understand who you're playing against sometimes in pvp and it's important to understand who you want to spectate spectating is a very very important tool and an incredibly useful resource in pokemon if you want to learn how to play if you want to see the best be the best and practice and everything like that you can do that in pokemon you can literally load up a match watch two of the best look at this rank 25 rank 34 two of the best random players in the world right now we can just go ahead and watch them battle see their strategies see how they play things this poor guy is in an incredibly atrocious spot against spikes and stealth rocks with his pidgeot pidgeot and everything um you can learn so much. But look, look, look how close this fight is. Like, randoms is not just RNG. This is an incredibly, incredibly close fight with, you know, 3v3, everything going on. It's pretty nuts. Um, but th this is like an incredibly... We can just VOD review. This is an incredibly important resource. That Bastion living at 1 HP. That was so unfortunate. Uh, and his Typhlosion gets dragged out. Can his Typhlosion actually win this game? Does he have, does he have Scarf Eruption? The Persian's faster, I guess. Okay, anyway, I'm getting distracted. Anyways, this is a crazy resource. You can learn so much information. Make sure to watch these VOD review uh, if you want to learn. All right, but now we're finally going to be talking about actually playing PvP. So, the first thing you need to play PvP in Pokemon is four gym badges. That's it. That's all you need. Four gym badges in your first region. And then now you can go ahead and go over to randoms and queue up for matchmaking. Now, randoms is where I absolutely encourage every single new player to start because you don't need any Pokemon to play randoms. They're going to provide you those Pokemon. They're going to provide you that team. That team, which may have taken you a couple million Pokemon to make otherwise in tons and tons of time. Randoms is just an utterly fantastic way to get a feel for whether or not you actually enjoy Pokemon PvP. It may not be for everyone, and this is a free way to test it out. Now, randoms is going to be extremely different from traditional structured Pokemon play or constructed Pokemon play where you're actually constructing a team. It's a lot more on the fly thinking, which in turn is going to cause you to learn a ton. You're going to learn speed tiers. You're going to understand what Pokemon are good at. You're going to understand what Pokemon want to do, what items they might use, different strategies Pokemon can use, etc., etc. Randoms can truly teach you a ton, but it can also teach you some misinformation sometimes. So you do have to be aware that there are differences between randoms and different play styles you're going to play randoms differently than what you would play constructed a really good example of this is information concealing within a randoms game your opponent can't see your six pokemon but at the beginning of a constructed game you actually can see all of your opponent's six pokemon so it's really important to essentially jot down hey i'm facing up against blaziken i need to watch out for u-turn i need to figure out if i need to figure out information i need to figure out whether this blaziken is scarf whether it's life orb i have a quagsire does it have hidden power grass oh let's check pvp statistics for example my opponent has a Blaziken. Let's see if it has Hidden Power Grass. Quagsire's 28% usage percent right now. That means that Blaziken is probably running HP Grass. Let's check it. Life Orb. That means HP Grass. I know that's, that's very convoluted for new players, but this is sort of an example. Uh, checking for constructed play, whether or not uh, just kind of getting information and stuff is really important. In randoms, you don't have that luxury to sort of get all the information off the bat. You kind of slowly decipher information. But this is also great for new players as it teaches you the same process, but at a much slower pace. So I'll go ahead and show you guys. I'm going to try to jump into a randoms game and actually show you my exact thought process, or at least what I would do during a randoms fight. All right, so this is what it looks like when you load up into a game. You're going to see your Pokemon here. They're a little squished on my screen, but you can also go ahead and right-click them and see them all. We see Empoleon with Ice Beam. We have Grass Coverage. We have Stealth Rocks. It's really important to understand all the information on screen right now. So first things first, we want to check, hey, do we have a Stealth Rock Setter? Yes, we do have a Stealth Rock Setter. Do we have a way to answer Stealth Rocks? I don't think so. Let's go ahead and double-check though everything. 
We also want to check for one of the first things I check for when I load into a randoms game is which of my Pokemon have choice items. You need to understand that if you switch a Pokemon in, is it going to be choice locked? So we see a Yanmega with a Watt Berry. Uh, this lowers something. It should be it should lower some sort of uh, damaging move against it. Would be my guess. I'll have to double check on that. Honestly, uh, we see Jinx with Focus Sash and Lovely Kiss. First thing you want to do is you want to check all of your moves and you want to check all of your items. We have Leftovers on Empoleon. We have Life Orb on Roserade. That'll be important. It has Sunny Day, so we might want to set up Sun against certain matchups. Now, if you have a Sunny Day Pokemon, you might want to not set it up if you have like a lot of Water Pokemon, but only one Sun Pokemon. We have a Pachirisu with U-Turn and Discharge. It's important to understand that Discharge is a 30% chance to paralyze, so that is a good uh, way to spread paralysis and go to spread status. We have a Rotom with Pain Split, Sub, Discharge, etc. A lot of Leftovers mons. I don't think we have any... We have no choice item mons, so that's really important to understand. So right now, we are in Polion facing down Porygon Z. Now, Porygon Z is a huge special attacker, and we know that from base information. So Empoleon has a decent special defense and like, can be pretty bulky. I'm a little scared of this thing just having thunder. Uh, this thing has pretty insane coverage or having some grass move or some way to deal with me. I believe thunder is probably the thing I'm the most scared of here. However... Um, I'm actually going to play this differently than how you would in a constructed game. So in a constructed game, there's a good chance you switch here, but I think I'm actually going to go ahead and go for a Stealth Rock. I'm a little scared of a Nasty Plot as well, but Stealth Rock is pretty safe here because look, and there you go. That's what I'm talking about. When information is withheld, you can predict in randoms, oh, that this Porygon Z has a thunder, but if I did that and I switched out there, I would be at a huge disadvantage, whereas if I played a little riskier here, but at the same time, it's not really risky because we don't have any information yet. Um, I went ahead and went for those stealth rocks off the bat uh, to essentially get uh, at advantage and then essentially also get some information. So now I have information that he probably doesn't have an electric type attack. Um, he switched over to Raichu, an electric Pokemon to deal with. I'm running out of time to play a little bit faster. But it's really important to sort of make those plays and randoms to actually uncover that information. Now, there is obvious information we can surmise, such as, oh, he's switching to Raichu. This thing obviously has an electric attack, etc., etc. So from here, I'm probably going to switch over to uh, Pachirisu to tank that attack really easily. I set up Stealth Rocks against him, so now he's going to have a lot harder of a time actually switching around like I, unlike I am. Uh, I'm going to head over to Pachirisu. I am faster than this Raichu as well. Speed tiers are going to be super, super, super important. I'm probably going to go ahead and Super Fang just to chip it down quite a bit. And then if I see if I have another switch to go into, is this thing faster as well? This is not. It did Nasty Plot up. So I do want to be a little careful here. Um, I could switch over to Jinx and abuse that. The speed of 196. I'm going to go ahead and Super Fang this. There's a lot of different plays here. He's going to Focus Blast me, which has a 70% chance to miss. So that's honestly quite good for me. He does get the special defense drop, unfortunately. Now, that's also important, obviously, to keep in mind. There's lots of information like this in randoms, and it's really, really important to just play things slow, play things smart. I'm taking a lot more time here to think than my opponent, but I'm also quite ahead at the current time. Now, we have information that he's Nasty Plot plus Focus Blast. I'm going to switch over to Ra Roserade here. Unfortunately, he did have a move to hit me, and that's totally okay. I went ahead and U-turned out. I do have to play a little bit faster since my time is running out, but he is going to be chipped down here, essentially. I can actually switch back over to my Pachirisu if I want, or switch over to something else to keep this thing alive. I don't know what the hidden power actually was. I am slower here. Whatever I switch to will probably die, um, but... I'll be able to keep... I'm going to go ahead and just sacrifice my Rose Raid. I'm okay with losing this here versus I'd actually rather keep my Pachirisu. There's a couple of different plays that you can do. Um, you could switch over to your Pachirisu and possibly live or just let it go or whatever. I'm going to die a Life Orb there. We know he has Life Orb, so it goes down there. So making plays like that is really important. It's also important to understand that at this point in the game, he has seen my Empoleon and he has seen my Pachirisu. So those are probably two of the Pokemon that I want to bring back. I don't want to bring out a random new Pokemon for him to see and give him more information. Now, this is a really important thing to keep in mind in randoms. My opponent, their bronze on, I was able to scald them into 30% chip, but that's not very good. Uh, and what happened is he's actually going to, he's trying to calm mind and set up. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to Pachirisu uh, and be able to chip him down a little bit more with Super Fang and everything and kind of chip him down. He might be able to rest up after, and if he rests up, it should be okay. I should be able to switch over to something like my Yan Mega and go for a Swords Dance and take him out that way. If you take him on Pachirisu, that's totally okay. Um, there we go. So 
we're taking a trade here essentially i'm going to keep continuing to super fang him down uh, he might go for a rest here and once again that is totally okay but i do don't want, you don't want to let your opponent turbo set up set up is something that is very very scary in randoms and you have to play against it properly now i should be super safe to probably go over to yon mega here i could also go back to empoleon uh, and try to go for the skull but i'm not sure if it kills there after double or triple calm mine so i'm gonna make the safe play go over to yon mega there is a chance that he actually just switches out so part of me wants to sd here however that play is so much riskier and so much greedier i'm gonna go for the safe play which is the leech life go ahead and take this thing out should be enough damage to ko it and now we're up uh we're up four pokemon against four right now Something else that I like to ask myself in randoms are what are the odds of what his other Pokemon might be? And what I mean by that is sort of a typing thing. They'll generally give you a pretty good typing spread in randoms in terms of your actual Pokemon's typing, right? So right now we see two ground types on his team out of visibility uh, in total. There's a really good chance that this last Pokemon isn't a ground type. So we see two ground types, we see an electric type, we see a steel type, we see a normal type. This last Pokemon is probably something like a fighting type it could be a bug type it could be a you know probably not electric because we see the raichu uh maybe a fire type probably a water type water types are really common and really core so i'm guessing that this last pokemon is probably a water type would be my would be my final guess or yeah, there's parasects or a grass or a bug type so there we go that's pretty fair as well so there's tons of things uh to understand in that, in that like typing guess situation it's it's you gotta be careful it's not always gonna be accurate but you, you can make summarizations and you can make predictions based on the typings you see on your opponent's team in randoms it doesn't look, look it does look like the uh example game that i played is going to be a w for me which is really nice that doesn't always happen and you know it can be, it can be a little bit of rng i could have played poorly i haven't played randoms in quite a bit so it's nice to see uh, i still have it a little bit hopefully i gave you guys some good information while actually playing that match and ggs to my opponent they played very well and I need to preface to you guys, don't be afraid of losing. I know I've said this before, but do not be afraid to lose. There's a really good chance that you'll just lose your first 20 games back to back to back. I can, I, you know what? I'll go ahead and show you guys some humility. Look at my NU personal stats when I came back to the game. So I used to play NU heavily between 2013 to 2015. Now, things changed quite a bit from 2015 to like 2017 or 2019 uh when i came back to the game 2020 and i started playing nu look at these atrocious win rates i lost a ton and it's just bound to happen whether you're new to pvp what but it slowly improves look at this my win rate slowly improves over time and that's a really cool thing to see um you're bound to lose it is okay to come back to the game or just be trying to look at this slowly okay oh and six <laughs> uh slowly uh come back to the game or getting into pvp for the first time at all you're gonna lose and that's okay it's a normal part of learning if you're someone who hasn't put as much time or put as much effort or has been haven't been practicing as of recently versus these other other players um it, it, it you have to be okay with losing it's gonna suck uh you're gonna lose but that's okay and that's just a super important part of the pokemon process Quick shout out to FZF for watching, man. I super appreciate it. But back to being okay with losing. The main thing you want to take from each game, don't worry about your win-loss if you're getting into Pokemon PvP. What you want to worry about is your mistakes. Focus on what mistakes you made and how you can improve on them in the future. Refining the process of PvP and getting better in that actual skill is so much more important than caring about each individual win and loss. If you refine your process, the wins will come. All right, but I believe that is randoms covered. So now it's time to actually talk about getting into constructed play and structured PvP in Pokemon, aka OU, UU, NU, or doubles. You can even play stuff like Little Cup. There are unofficial tournaments held for that on the forum. So if you're interested in a more specific or niche maybe type of PvP, those, those are available, just in, a, just in a much less common or much less available way. Now, first things first is covering what tier do you actually want to get into? And I do have a video already talking about this subject, but I'll quickly recite what I talked about in that video. In my opinion, the best way to choose what PvP tier you want to play is usually by picking your favorite Pokemon in the entire game and then playing whatever tier that Pokemon is in. 
So for example, my favorite Pokemon of all time is Shuckle. Now Shuckle is in the untiered PvP tier, so I'm gonna go ahead and pick up NU. That's always been the tier that I love. Now, if I wanted to build a team around Shuckle, I would go ahead and pick some of the strongest Pokemon at the top because Shuckle is very weak. Shuckle is not good in Pokemon PvP. If I actually go up here and I search for Shuckle, I'm certain that his usage rate will be extremely low and his win rate atrocious non even negotiable 15 16 percent win rate is utterly atrocious um so if i want to make chuckle work you you can do it you know you can still have them on a team but i really do recommend probably trying to pick with a stronger pokemon but if you're stubborn like me i want to use chuckle so i would go something like chuckle blaziken rotom quag sire and then some sort of other sets down here now i wouldn't just go blaziken rotom quag electros septile you wouldn't just pick the top five used pokemon you could it would honestly be a really good core but often the top five most used there's usually two or three or maybe four that are really good together but you will encounter some sort of um repetitiveness or some sort of lack of synergy at some point um so for example if i ran a team that was blaziken rotom quag electra septile i don't really have a great full wall here now i may not need that um i may be missing some coverage i may be missing some i have some sort of fragilities here i don't really have a i don't have any i mean maybe quag so i can set up stealth rocks i don't think i have any way i've can you have default rotom i guess it's honestly a pretty good core if you just want to know those top five but that might not always be the case um for example I might recommend something like Blaziken, Quagsire, uh, Golbat, very good Pokemon in the NU tier, and then maybe Steelix for a defensive wall, and they could rock something else uh, a little more offensive or something turbo setup if you want to go something like Strafty, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I would, I would kind of break it up a little bit more uh, and have a much more diverse team as opposed to just picking the top five most used, you know, PowerPoint. You want to look for synergies. Synergies within teams are going to be so much more important than actually just picking the most powerful Pokemon. But team building is unbelievably complicated. There are a million things to think about with team building. So the main thing that I recommend to new players when team building is sticking to the rules of 2-2-2. Two, two, two. And what I mean by that is you're essentially building a balanced team. When I think of 2-2-2, two, 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 I think of uh, you want two semi-fast to super fast Pokemon. You want two semi-tanky slash like bulky Pokemon, and then you want two full tanky-ish Pokemon. So a really good example of that is something like this team. This team right here is a decent example of 2-2-2. Two, two, two. Now, there's a lot of things going on here, but I'll go ahead and break down the basic premise. So, we have two fast attackers in different sets. We have a fast physical fire fighting type, as well as a fast special uh, electric ghost type. This Rotom is not EV trained in moveset and everything, so it's not totally complete. Ignore that for the time being. It's not super important, but the important thing is we have a fast physical attacker, a fast special attacker. That's our first two. Our second two is sort of a mid-tier, this is a slower tier, but a mid-tier bulky set of Pokemon that can do a couple things. Uh, this Excavalier also acts as sort of a slot in here. Honestly, I'll probably put him over the Bufalant. So these two Pokemon are sort of our middle two. Uh, these are sort of a bulky mid-tier speed, but Bufalant sort of fills that role as well. Mid-tier speed Pokemon. Uh, the Quagsire is much slower. The Extra is much slower, but we'll talk about that with Trick Room here. So this is kind of a much more complicated version of 2-2-2. Two, two, two. This is almost like 2-2-1-1-1. Two, two, one, one, one? It's, it's a little more complicated. But anyways, the, the main premise stands of two fast Pokemon uh, accomplishing different things very very different things you want to like very two different fast Pokemon. one we have a very fast physical firefighting and a very fast special um sort of ghost this can be switched into fighting type attacks etc etc uh we then have our acquired sire uh and this bouffalon now it's important to have a combination within the team with synergy so the combination here is that we have a water absorb pokemon and a sap sipper pokemon um not only can this be really beneficial and really powerful but it's also important to uh, notice that Quagsire is a Pokemon with four times weakness to grass, and Bufalant is a Pokemon with Sap Zipper. Also, a very underutilized, underused Pokemon with Sap Zipper that most people don't know or don't remember that this Pokemon has Sap Zipper. The Quagsire Bufalant Bait and Switch combo is one of my favorite combos in all of Pokemon PvP. The essential premise is that you bring in Quagsire, bait them into a grass type, or bait them into some sort of grass type attack, because it's really the only way to damage Quagsire. Um, get off a fat earthquake by going 252 attack EVs, which most people don't expect. Most people expect 
expect a fully fi uh, physically defensive or a fully defensive Quagsire. So you get off a large attack, and then when they go for that Giga Drain to sustain back up, you switch over to Buffalon, get an attack boost, and now can go ahead and go into Turbo Setup with Swords Dance or Cotton Guard. That's the middle two. They're sort of the combination. They have a strategy involved. Um, they're synergy, and they cover different bases. Now, the last two, these are sort of the main tank Pokemon. Now, Estavalier and Buffalon are pretty interchangeable here. Buffalon is also extremely tanky, uh, purposefully. He's EV'd to be an extremely tanky Pokemon. Careful nature, 252 HP, defense EV, special defense, and then some speed to outspeed a certain speed tier. That's kind of complicated. We'll get into that later on, maybe. Um... That's very, that's very important, um, but Buffalant, or sorry, Escavalier, uh, is a really good Trick Room abuser, and most Pokemon on this team are good Trick Room abusers. Now, this Audino is a perfect example of a tank's tank. This Pokemon's job is just to jump around, tank things up, take damage, and then get back out. Uh, this Audino's job is to be able to switch into something, tank an attack with its huge bulk, uh, and then switch out and heal up slowly with Regenerator. Very, very good ability. Audino is very underutilized. Aldino definitely suffers from um, the four move slot syndrome though, the four move slot issue. It actually has tons and tons of good moves that it wants to use but can't really always utilize them. Um, for example, I wish I could have like teleport on this thing. I wish I could have thunder wave to spread paralysis. I might put both of those things on this at some point. This thing gets its move slot changed around a ton. But the general premise is two speedy Pokemon, two mid-tier speed Pokemon with synergy, and then two tanky Pokemon, uh, usually full tank, or you could have one full tank Pokemon, um, and then one more off tank. Now, it also is important to note that you want something that can tank defensive attacks really well, and then something that can tank specially defensive attacks really well. So, for example, this Escavalier can kind of do both, but it's usually better at tanking physical attacks due to its typing, being Bug Steel, any fire type attack is going to obliterate it. Um, Audino can be really good at tanking both. However, mine is EV'd into special defense, so it's going to be better at taking special defense attacks. This Quagsire, for example, though, is better at taking defense attacks. So there's lots of different combinations and things to put around there. It's also important to note that Rotom is a ghost type, and it can tank those fighting type attacks, essentially another way to absorb physical attacks. This team is just overall a pretty good starter NU team. I'm pretty sure there's tons of issues with it. Like we have two normal types, for example, which is kind of scary against Blaziken. But once again, we have certain strategies specifically against Blaziken, um, like this Quired Sire uh, and this Rotom even. But there's definitely going to be weaknesses to any team, but it's really important to have whatever strengths possible. And once again, team building is so complex. I could sit here for one to two to even three hours and have an entire video dedicated to it. Or... I can lead you guys over to an expert and give you guys his opinion on it. Let's welcome AFC Adino, one of the best Pokemon PvPers around, as well as just being one of the best Pokemon PvPers around. I really appreciate you being here, man. Go ahead and drop your knowledge. Hey everyone, it's AFC Adino, and I'm super excited to be a guest on Petrowski's video. In case you don't know me, I'm a content creator on YouTube, mainly playing Pokemon PvP battles with live commentary uh, for this video Petrowski asked me to share uh, some questions I ask myself when I'm building my teams and yeah I'm more <laughs> more than happy to share my thoughts with you guys however if you're new to the game I recommend not building your own team right away instead start by borrowing team ideas from skilled players uh, get a grasp of the current metagame first find out figure out why the teams of these players actually work and Maybe you can apply those kind of things into your own teams and hopefully improving in that way. But yeah, once you're ready to build your own team, you should always ask yourself the first question. What do I want to play and how do I plan to win? This sets your general win condition, uh, which can change during the battle or depending on your opponent, of course. But some examples of win conditions are setting up Sword Sense with Scizor, and sweeping with bullet punch, setting up the rain with Pelipper and then spamming surf with Kingdra, um, getting Galadin on free switches and spamming Sacred Sword or Psycho Cut to kill your opponent's Pokemon. But yeah, the goal of team building is to make winning as easy as possible. So make additions to your team that facilitate your general win condition. Keep in mind guys, 
the general win condition can change depending on your opponent or depending on the situation in the game. <laughs> anyway, um, I usually... Um, the, the most general teams are balanced teams, so uh, for this video I would give you guys some of my thoughts when I build balanced teams. The first one I always ask myself is who is going to be the stealth rocker of the team? Because uh, stealth rock is uh, the best move in the game. Um, you don't have to decide directly, of course, you can f first set out your game plan, but this is something you generally need on your team. Then you gotta ask yourself, who is going to be my main damage dealer on the team? This is usually a heavy hitter. Uh, this can be a Pokemon with a high attack or special attack and a strong base power move, uh, like Conkelder with close combat. Um, also gotta consider, do I have decent coverage? Um, are my, basically, are my moves are generally not resisted by my opponent is the question. That's the case, then uh, that's usually good for you. Um, also ask yourself, um, some, how do I stop the most common sweepers in the game? Currently, um, on top of my head, uh, it's Gyarados, Dragonite, Volcarona, and Scizor. Those are like the most common sweepers in the game right now. Do I have ways to stop these? Obviously, they can be through defensive answers or offensive answers, uh, but you gotta figure that out. Um, also, gotta the, um, think about how fast your team is. Is my team? Do I have something that's faster than Superior? Because Superior is a fast Pokemon which increases his special attack every time he's using Leaf Storm, uh, which can be really difficult to defend. So, if you're not able to defend against him, it's good to have something that can outspeed him and revenge kill him. Something like Weavile. If you don't have a Pokemon that can do that, you can use the Choice Scarf item, for example, to um, outspeed it on Pokemon like Infernape and Hydreigon. Um, also, consider if your team is weak against Rain Teams. If so, then add build key Water Type Resist or Chance here and Blissey so they can defend against Kingdra, or maybe ways to remove Sand, uh, remove Rain through. Uh, abilities like Sandstream from Hippowden and Serenitar with the Sandstorm. Um, yeah, guys. Um, also, do you have ways to get s your Pokemon safely in uh, through U-turn or Volt Switch? It's usually in a lot of teams you'll see this. You see it on Rodom, you see it on Mianchao. To get in your threats safely and basically kill your opponent or make it easier to get them in and kill your opponent's Pokemon. And also pivots are really good to have. So if, for example, um, if you have, if your team has multiple Pokemon weak against a certain typing, for example, you have um, Garchomp, Gliscor, um, Superior on your team, they all have nice type weakness, then you must have something that resists ice type attacks. I don't think you need to be able to resist every attack, every typing but if you have multiple weakness to one typing you must have a resist to it um, always ask yourself that question too but yeah if you guys need more team building tips you can check out my team building video of course uh Petrosky have has a lot of team building videos as well but yeah that's gonna be it for me guys thank you for having me Petrosky, and yeah good luck everyone with your team building endeavors and most of all most importantly of all have fun in your pvp battles peace out all right, first things first, I got to say a huge thank you to AFC for actually taking the time out of his day to drop all of that knowledge and being able to join in on this video. Please go check out his content. He is by far the best Pokemon PvPer and best Pokemon YouTuber that creates content. He has a great deal on his Patreon. Not trying to chill out too hard, but I think it's a legitimately good deal where you can sub to him for like one or five or ten bucks a month. You can actually get a private coaching session for like 10 bucks a month from a top 10 Pokemon player. He was ranked top eight or top six or so uh, in Scarlet and Violet OU PVP on Sh Pokemon Showdown uh, this year. That is literally the most popular PVP format of the current gen traditional Pokemon game. To be in the top 10 essentially in the world in the most popular format is a very, very telling sign of your po PVP prowess. And it's one of the utmost and imp most impressive accomplishments you can do in Pokemon. So to have a private coaching session from someone who's a top 10 in the entire world is 
phenomenal. Imagine if you could go be a, get a quarterback coaching from Tom Brady. It's something truly insane, and I think it's worth talking about and worth taking advantage of. And like he mentioned, he does also have his PvP teams available on his Patreon for $1 a month, I believe. All right, but quickly before moving on from team building, I want to talk about what I consider a PvP Pokemon and what you might want to consider a PvP Pokemon. One of the biggest mistakes that I see new players trying to get into PvP is to make a full team of 6x31 Pokemon. I absolutely do not recommend doing this. I recommend going 2x31 on sweepers like Sceptile, 2x31 in the offensive stat that you need and the speed stat that you need. You cannot skimp on speed and then going 25 plus in the defenses and HP. Don't worry about the other attack stat if your Pokemon doesn't need it. This is just a PvP gift Pokemon or a PvP reward Pokemon, those things we talked about earlier. Uh, so it just has 25 plus in every other stat. But this is a perfect example of 2x31 plus 20 to 25 plus. You do not need perfect Pokemon to play PvP effectively in Pokemon Mo. You absolutely don't. You can reach rank 1 with Pokemon like this very easily. Um, there is so much more skill involved, and the, the very, very minute times... We're having 31 special defense on Sceptile is so rare that it's usually just not going to matter or not going to impact your games. Usually just having that speed stat and offensive stats are nice, but you can even do like 25 plus or something on Sceptile. But really just getting the practice in and getting those comps made and having different rotations of competitive teams or builds to jump around to is so much more important than having those perfect Pokemon. Now, one day, if you find a team that you absolutely love, that you're super diehard, uh, just love grinding with creating a five times 31 version of that team is is probably fantastic most pokemon don't even need six times 31 for example on this septile septile can go mixed but this is a fully physical septile it's not move set this is a fully physical septile since it's adamant nature you don't need 31 special attack on this septile it literally won't benefit it at all there's very few pokemon that actually need that you know both 31 attack and special attack scissor for example can't utilize special attack whatsoever rotom wash can't really utilize physical attack whatsoever uh things like garchomp and dragonite and tyranitar all can kind of utilize both uh, but it depends starmie can kind of utilize both because it can use the physical damage for rapid spin but that's about it getting a couple more damage on your rapid spin that can matter, but it's pretty minuscule. Gliscor is never going to use special attack. Uh, a really good example of a mixed Pokemon is something like Infernape. Uh, Infernape is definitely a very good offensive mixed threat. Usually goes naive nature for that reason. But definitely don't over worry about those green numbers. I actually made another video about PvP during the making of this video called Quick five tips for new players getting into pvp so if you're looking for a much more condensed version of this video maybe go check that out uh, there's also just some other tips and tricks in there that i may have not mentioned here there is so much to talk about when it comes to pvp so i am trying to hit on every point but if you feel like i missed something let me know in the comments down below but if you think i'm doing a decent job make sure to like this video and subscribe for daily pokemon content I also made a video talking about the best PvP cores right now in PvP during the making of this video, and that should also be linked in the description down below. Now those might be a bit dated by the time this video comes out, but the general premise should stand, and it's very, very possible that most of those are still fantastic options in the current metagame. All right, but to quickly summarize what we've covered so far, step one was research and actually watching videos, watching footage, covering statistics, etc., etc., and learning about Pokemon PvP. Step two was to grind randoms and learn about the basics from there, learn about different Pokemon base stats, and jet gather your general Pokemon PvP knowledge. Step three was team building, or you could follow AFC Adino's incredible advice and go ahead and uh, grab a team from an actual skilled player. It's very smart to do, very safe. Uh, and then step four or five was... Uh, uh, to actually go ahead and grind that level of PvP. Go grind OU, go grind UU, go grind NU, and actually try to learn a constructed format. Now, you'll notice from transitioning from randoms to constructed, you will start to make all kinds of different mistakes. Uh, and you'll almost have to learn a little bit from scratch, but not truly because you've learned tons of information from randoms. But there will be a huge separation and a huge difference, and that is normal, that is okay, and that's important to understand. 
Now, during step four, during the grinding process of OUU and NU or whatever constructed format you're playing, it's important to combine all the previous elements, combine the research, combine, you know, the information gaining stuff from randoms, per combine all those things and essentially learn to do the best you can. That's a little more difficult to explain. There's tons of things to consider. Like AFC Adino said, he mentioned your win con and now your win con will constantly be changing throughout a game. That's really important as well. A really good example of this is let's say your entire team is walled by a quack. Sire. Your main priority should be getting rid of that Quagsire or getting rid of other Pokemon that are protecting that Quagsire. That's really important to consider. That may include something like considering the fact that your Blaziken has hidden power grass and trying to bait their Quagsire into a false sense of security. Maybe not using hidden power grass against a different Pokemon that would be super effective against to make him think that you don't have it. Playing those mind games in Pokemon PvP gets really intense. And information is truly key in Pokemon PvP. Alright, but let's talk about step 5. What happens after you grind constructed play for a while? Maybe you're getting good, maybe you're reaching higher ranks, maybe like 600, 650, maybe even 700 if you're getting really, really, really good. What next? What's the next step in a PvP player's lifespan? The next step is tournaments. There are automated tournaments happening for every level of constructed play and every tier happening all the time. Like daily PvP tournaments are happening in Pokemon Mo. And these are really great beginner tournaments. These are great to get into them. I have never won one of these. I've participated in very few and they are very tough. It is crazy the difference of level of skill and uh, competitiveness going from ranked open queue to these tournaments. Things get really tough and it's a great way. Great, great, great way to learn. The metagame of Pokemon being used in tournaments usually also drastically changes um, from ranked open play. I remember the first time that I ever saw a tank Garchomp was in a tournament. And that stuff can really catch you off guard, so you might actually have to do some different metagame scouting of your own during these tournaments. A really good way to do that is by actually going to this page, Tournaments, under the PvP uh, icon, and you can go to Tournament History, and you can go spectate matches from these previous tournaments. Let's say that we want to see the final match between, you know, the person who won, named O, OU, and the other person. We can spectate this final match and learn so much about the metagame and what is going on. We see Blaziken, we see Tentacruel, we see Rotom, uh, Piloswine, Bronzor, Golbat, Clefable, Quagsire we've been talking so much about. There are so many Pokemon here that we see. Uh, it really gives us really, really good insight into really high level play, not just open Q ranked. There is also the official events page on the Pokemon forums, and here you'll find things like team tournaments, or the Hall of Fame, or the history of team tournaments, or other PvP events happening that might necessarily not be advertised in-game, or even be automated in-game. One of the coolest things in Pokemon, if you want to be the best PvP player in the world, is to go show your stuff at team tournaments. Team tournaments are what they sound like. It's a tournament held for all the teams around Pokemon, and usually the best PvP team is who takes the prize. There is a PvP team tournament every single month, and then the best teams from those monthly tournaments get invited to a giant tournament at the end of the year, where you have the chance to be crowned the best Pokemon PvP team of that year. We see Team 2022, Optic 1, and 2021, Brazil, 2020, no rematch. One of my favorite things, look at this back-to-back -back wins from no rematch. One of my favorite things, and I know Asgard Warriors had a crazy run for three years in a row, one of my favorite things in Pokemon is to look back on the history of these and remembering teams like Lyle. I was playing heavily when Lyle was the team to beat back in the day. Uh, seeing these teams be kind of praised as esports gods was really, really cool to me at the time. And it's, it still can be the case. Um, and it's really interesting to go back and see the, the history of Pokemon teams and see, you know, who is the best at PvP and see how it's been changing over the years. It's crazy how we're seeing more and more new teams pop up in current day, which is incredible to see. But if you truly want to be the best, you got to play for those tournaments. Tournaments are where things really shine and really start to change. Being rank 1 or top 10 or high rank in the ladder though on Pokemon is still incredibly impressive and a great goal to shoot for. That's probably the most realistic one that most people can go for and it's a super solid one. So there's tons of end game goals when it comes to Pokemon PvP and not just, you know, trying to grind a ladder a little bit for those free Pokemon or whatever. There's so much more to explore and so much more to eventually delve into.
Pokemon PvP is extremely complicated. There is such a huge barrier to entry, and then it sinks down so deep, it feels like a massive ocean. It's such an incredibly complex thing, as Pokemon PvP obviously is, but Pokemon PvP has all these other nooks and crannies that aren't really talked about to such detail. So I really hope that this video was helpful. That brings us to the conclusion of it. If it was, make sure to like this video. That helps me out a ton in the algorithm. Make sure to subscribe to the channel for daily Pokemon videos. Make sure to follow the Twitch for streams Monday through Thursday at 12 p.m. ET. Discord link is down below if you're interested in that. Once again, it's a great place to ask PvP questions within the right chat channels. And if you want to go above and beyond, YouTube memberships, Twitch Primes, Twitch subs, and PayPal slash Venmo really all do allow me to stay around full time and allow me to try my best to make better Pokemon content every single day. If you stayed with me until this point, I don't even know how to begin to say thank you. I tremendously appreciate it, and I only hope that my content and my videos are either A, helpful to your Pokemon journey, or B, good, mildly entertaining background content while you yourself are grinding your teams out, EV training, XP training, shiny hunting, whatever it may be. Today, I hope you're having fun, I hope you're playing Pokemon, and I hope you have a great day. See you guys later, I'll see you tomorrow, peace. Hey, thanks so much for watching the entire video. I really appreciate that. And if your name is on this list, I appreciate you even more. Thank you to everyone who goes above and beyond and supports my channel and allows me to make content full time. I couldn't do it without you guys. Thank you so much. Have a great day.